Welcome to our expert webinar. I am Daniel Otero, CEO of SCAL International, and I would like to thank all of you for joining us. The current COVID-19 crisis and restrictions are affecting the modus operandi of child sex offenders. No country or child is immune to this ever growing risk. As the world responds to COVID, push factors that facilitate or lead to sexual abuse and exploitation of children are expected to intensify. All partners need to address the rapidly changing situation and it is devastating effects to ensure that children's protection remains central to the current and future responses, including for the recovery of travel tourism sector. Because the numbers are really shocking. It is estimated that around 3 million people travel the world with the intention of sexually exploiting children under the age of 18. To bring more or some more information on this issue and to understand the different position, we have with us today Damien Brosnan. is the Global Secretariat Manager of the Code Organization based in Bangkok and with members across the globe. He works with local non-governmental organization, unit nation agencies, and the private sector to raise awareness and promote action on child protection in travel and tourism. He has uh, worked with the codes in 2015, following roles with CARE, UNICEF working on emergency Ripley. Welcome, Damien, and thank you for staying with us today. Thank you for the welcome, and it's very nice to join you all. Um, this is a very, very sensitive issue, and unfortunately, not much is mentioned about it. Today, we want to bring this to the table because we think that with more information and more participation, we can all build more protective environments we will start with an informative video, please. Sexual exploitation of children can happen anywhere. As a tourism professional, do you know what to do in cases of child sexual exploitation? The Code is an internationally recognized member organization led by the industry. Provide awareness, tools, and support to our members to protect children from sex tourism. Be a part of our strong network of tourism professionals who unite to take a stand for children. By being a member of the code, you join the leaders in responsible tourism because, in today's competitive landscape, it is no longer enough to be a follower. By joining the code, your customers, staff, and partners will be proud of your company's commitment. All members are recognized on the code's website, have access to an online portal with easy step-by-step -step guidance and unique e-learning modules designed specifically for frontline tourism staff based on real cases. Any tourism company or business can join the code in a few simple steps. As tourism professionals, you are in a unique position to make a difference. The code, we protect children from sex tourism. Join today at thecode.org. Thank you. Uh, Damien, what is the real scale of the problem globally? I know that it's very difficult to provide this information, but in your experience, and you concentrate all the information around this problem. Yeah, it's a very good question. And, and you noted the, the potential number of perpetrators who are traveling uh, with the intention of exploiting children, which is a very scary number indeed. Numbers are very difficult to quantify. 
Every country has different reporting mechanisms. The level of underreporting of this crime is significant. Victims often either feel ashamed or that they'll be stigmatized or in some ways they'll face punishment themselves. And some victims don't realize that they have been a victim of a crime. Um, they, they are either too young or they don't see it. They see it more as a transactional occurrence, uh, sometimes for money or, or for other uh, equipment or a mobile phone or, or whatever. So there's not always a recognition that it is a crime. But our position is that all children um, who are taken advantage of um, sexually, that that's rape, that's a crime. And it's a very difficult subject to, to talk about, but it is, it is a fact of life, unfortunately. So we don't have concrete figures globally. We do have a couple of proxy figures. So we, we look at um, figures from the ILO um, who talk about about 40 million people around the world engaged in modern slavery and about one in four of these are children. Um, and about, of the 40 million, estimated about 5 million uh, are engaged in forced sexual exploitation. So they're pretty significant numbers. Um, and the message we and reinforce is that this happens all over the world. It's not easy to say, but it happens in every country that, that we're working in, every country that your members are in. And so we all have a responsibility to play to try and reduce the risk to children and make sure that we're all helping to protect them. Mm, I understand, but which are the, the, the areas or countries most affected by this criminal uh, practice? So, we had a, a global study it was called um, that was run by the ECPAT International Network a few years ago in 2016, uh, but it also had contributions from 67 different organizations from UN agencies to law enforcement to the private sector. And that really looked at some of the trends, both in different regions of the world, but also in the types of crime, the types of victims and the types of perpetrators. And what that really emphasized is that the stereotypes uh, are sometimes true, but not Increasingly not. So one example I can give you is the sort of stereotype of, uh, say, a North European or a European older white gentleman traveling to Southeast Asia or the Caribbean to exploit children. Yes, that happens. But in fact, the majority of traveling sex offenders are domestic or regional travelers. So it's actually within domestic tourism and travel that this is the biggest scale of the problem. And there's a few reasons for that. Obviously, there's a lot more domestic than international travel. There's often an easier access to children because of similar languages or similar um, cultures. cultures. And, and not, yeah, and sort of knowledge of, of where children might be found in particular places. Uh, and the other thing that we've found is that the manifestations of all sexual exploitation of children looks quite different in different countries. So in some parts of the world, You've got a lot of uh, online exploitation of children, whether that's recorded or, or streaming via the dark web. Uh, in other cases, it's, it's a higher prevalence of trafficking for the sexual exploitation of children. And in other places, it's more, uh, as I was discussing before, like a rewards-based exchange um, where it's a transactional approach, sometimes uh, arranged via social media and sometimes arranged spontaneously. Uh, and the other thing that I should probably mentioned on the global study is that the other key finding was there are two types of offenders that we talk to. There are preferential offenders who are basically what we would traditionally think of as pedophiles. They're looking to exploit children. And then there are also what we call situational offenders. And these are people who might be traveling for work. They might be traveling by themselves to a different place. And they find themselves, they didn't travel there with the purpose of exploiting a child, but they find themselves in a situation where that becomes an available option. And for whatever reason, they, they, take that, uh, they take that opportunity. So it's a very mixed picture of victims and also perpetrators. Um, the traditional hotspots are kind of known, but I would actually avoid talking too much about sort of saying, yes, it's Southeast Asia, yes, it's Latin America, because as I said, it, it happens everywhere. It looks different, um, but it does, it does take place uh, all over the mm -hmm. world. But with, with this panorama, is there... <laughs> international legislation for the protection of children? International legislation. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no formal international legislation, uh, except for, you know, uh, the, the principles of human rights that, that should apply anyway. There are some uh, initiatives that have taken place. So the UNWTO for many years has had a code of ethics, 
um, a couple of years ago that was actually um, changed or adopted into a convention um, on, on ethics in tourism. And so that's now out to country states to, to ratify, to sign on. Uh, and once a certain level of ratific ratification has taken place, that will become a binding treaty. So it's a, it's a step further in terms of encouraging and requiring, in fact, countries to take action themselves. So that's the closest thing I would say that we have to a global framework. So far, Indonesia um, ratified the agreement last year, and I believe today they're the only ones so far. Uh, so what about governments and the control of this activity? Because it is, you say it's more local or, or national, uh, in, in the problem. Yeah, so it varies a lot from country to country. In a lot of countries, we're seeing an increase in the national legislation, either around tourism, which, which has an element of responsible tourism, which then has an element of child protection. Mm -hmm. Often it's the other way around. It's talking about legislation focused on child protection that then encompasses all industries, including tourism. Uh, so that it looks quite different, but it's increasingly happening. And the other side of the national legislation that we're seeing in countries, like I'm proud to say my country, Australia, is this concept of extraterritorial territorially, sorry, I never get it, um, which is where an offender travels from Australia, for example, to another country, exploit, sexually exploits a child, they can be prosecuted in the country of that child, but they can also then be prosecuted back in Australia when they return. And that's this increasingly so important. being used. Yeah, absolutely, because often they're able to buy their way out of the situation. But if there's a, a charge laid against them back in their home country, and it's a number of countries that have this now, that's hugely important as a disincentive. Um, and it also means that it's, they're much less likely to be repeat offenders because often their passports are confiscated and, and or a jail term is imposed if they're found to be guilty. There's a real challenge in getting evidence and getting witnesses and statements. But the fact that the legislation is there and can be used is a really big step forward. The other thing we do see in a few different countries is much smaller units of government. So maybe a provincial government or um, even a city um, government enacting their own legislation and requiring that companies involved in tourism in that you know, subsection of a country are taking steps to keep children safe as part of their license to operate as a tourism business. So there's both the punitive side, but then there's also the, you know, the carrot saying, you know, this is good for everyone. This is maintaining the reputation of our location. We should all do this together. And by the way, if you don't want to be part of this, we'll, we'll threaten or we will take away your license to operate here. Mm -hmm. So we all need to be aware. What should we pay attention to? Sure. So both as tourism professionals, but also as, as most of you, I imagine travel at least before the last couple of years, uh, extensively, there are some things we can all do. Um, let's start with as a, as a traveler or as a customer. So it's knowing that everyone has a part to play and knowing that if there is a situation that you see that just maybe feels a bit off, if there's some suspicious signs um, of an adult um, and a child together, it maybe just doesn't feel quite right, to know what you can do. And normally that is not to directly approach the situation. Normally it is to take note have details of when, where, the description of the, of the people involved, and also to be familiar with the fact that in most countries, there is a national hotline or local hotlines to report situations like this, often anonymously, um, to say, look, I, I saw something that doesn't look right, doesn't feel right. And then uh, those hotlines are able to link up with relevant authorities and to take further investigations or further action if necessary. So I think that as individuals, that's something we can do at least to, to know that we're a little bit empowered um, to take action without putting ourselves at risk um, and without putting the, the reputation of, of others at risk because it is about making sure that the right steps are being followed and, and the right uh, preventative measures are being taken. I should say that some of these national hotlines work better than others, of course, with, with most things in the world, but it is good to know and it's something that we also encourage um, companies in either code members or other companies to make their customers aware of saying, you know, if you, if you come across a situation, here's either the local police or the local tourist police or the child protection hotline. 
to at least put it in, in the mind of their customers and the travelers that if they do see something, they can say something and they should say something. There's also an international platform called Don't Look Away. Um, it's don't, don'tlookaway.info, I believe. And this is essentially a global database of all the different reporting mechanisms and hotlines. And that's been quite a good resource that's been put together um, for customers and for businesses to, to know um, where these facilities exist and what sort of facilities they are. And then if we look at the, the side as a tourism business, um, exactly. We, My next question: sure. we, What can we in in the tourist industry do to help uh, to mm. in, in these situations? Yeah. So, um, if there's a staff member or a tourism professional who directly observes um, a, a situation, then if the child is in immediate danger, then our advice is normally to call law enforcement. Um, there's normally an internal child protection policy and response mechanism, though, that really is important because if a housekeeper sees a situation, they need to feel empowered to talk to their manager and perhaps to their manager's manager uh, to, to take it up the chain and to know that action will be taken, um, that they're not gonna put themselves or their job at risk for saying something that they saw that might be suspicious. Um, and that the management knows that if they are told something, they need to take action um, with the appropriate authorities. So as staff at a, at a hotel or as a, a transport operator, Again, we say look out for some suspicious things. At check-in at a hotel, if the child is, is looking fearful or coerced, is dressed inappropriately for the time of day or the locale, um, is uh, looking under the effect of drugs or alcohol, um, those sorts of things. Or, or if, the, the, um, yeah, so if, if it's a housekeeping issue, for example, if the, the staff notice lots of different um, adult visitors coming in and out of a room over time. If there's a request either for no room changes or, or um, fresh tidy ups or uh, replenishment, or the other thing that can happen is that there's extra, extra demands for more towels, more sheets, more supplies. Uh, and then sometimes the perpetrators will you know, leave evidence. There might be pornographic material around. There might be a lot of um, you know, sexual materials or, or sexual aids or condoms or things like this. So it's things like that. And it's normally not just one thing. Um, normally it is um, a sequence of different things that just doesn't feel right. And maybe I can give an example of, of what how this plays out in a, in a hotel in, in India. That's exactly, about. because uh, could you share maybe successful example that sure. could serve as a model for, for our members around the world? Sure, this one's more about how the, the tourist felt in that situation because they, they approached the check-in counter um, with a young girl. Um, they looked, maybe they didn't look related. And the, the staff at the hotel explained that um, they had to see both of their identifications. And the, the, the adult said, no, I, I don't have it. You know, just check us in, please. We need to be somewhere else in a hurry. And the staff member stood very firm and said, I'm sorry, it's the policy for all, all guests. Doesn't matter if you're an adult or a child or whatever. We need to see everyone's identification. And as that was explained, the customer began to sort of take a different perspective and actually in the end really respected that and, and took it very much better than, than they started off taking it because they understood it, it was for the protection of the child. It was a positive proactive thing that that hotel was doing. It wasn't accusing them of being a criminal. It was saying, we apply this policy to all of our guests, all of our customers, and we're not picking on you. We're not saying anything about you. We're making sure that, that, that children are being protected. Um, in my presentation in the few minutes, I have a couple of other examples. Maybe I could speak then about Perfect. cases that have been prevented <laughs> from, from action from, from staff members. Perfect. Um, we have uh, um, some question from, from the audience, but if you agree, we, we share this uh, PPT um, and then we will uh, share this, these questions with, with you. That sounds fine to me. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, David. Thank you. Okay, I'm just waiting for the... Sorry, I'm just opening up my PPT. <laughs> Perfect. There it is. Um, maybe I can begin as, as it's opening just by talking about the code itself, um, because 
it's an interesting model where um, not an NGO per se, it's an initiative and it's an initiative that's hosted by a, an NGO or an NGO network um, called ECPAT International. And ECPAT International's mandate is to prevent the sexual exploitation of children um, in all its uh, forms uh, across the world. And so they work with um, governments on, on lobby and advocacy. They work with local NGOs. And in fact, there is a, a network of, of NGOs uh, that, that, that is uh, members or affiliates of, of ECPAT, over 100 um, ECPAT members around the world. Um, so it's really a very thorough network. And the, the strength that it brings is that it is, um, it's able to, to respond to the network members to very specific uh, local challenges, local legislation in local languages. And so the code is sitting within one of their programs and the program is called Sexual Exploitation uh, of Children in Travel and Tourism or, or SecTT as we call it. And so it's, it's really strong partnership because we're then able to work directly um, with local members of the code, which we call local code representatives. And most of those are ECPAT members. And so that way we can link to the sort of global initiatives that ECPAT International is doing uh, with the, the more local um, initiatives that are, that are taking place around the world. Mm -hmm. And do Daniela, you want, uh, yeah. sorry, do you want yeah. that as to put the, your PPT? Yeah, I'm very sorry. It's no, it's not... okay. Okay, <laughs> Esther, we wait you, so yeah, we yeah. we will share with our audience your your information because I think that this is the part of <coughs> with more value. How is possible to implement this in the debate day sure. at your company? You know what I mean. So this yeah. is absolutely important to see because it's, we know that you have a, a very big. Um, companies around uh, the code who support and implement these kind of things yes yes absolutely yeah it's it's we've got big and small companies it's a very um a very mixed group as, as you'll see in, in a minute okay okay thank you and sorry about the, the delay uh, it's okay um, it's okay Damien. go ahead so if you pop onto the next slide we'll talk about how how the code sort of fits in and how the different elements play out um, so, as I mentioned, the sexual exploitation of children is, is a global crime. Um, it's, it's a fact of life, unfortunately. What we emphasise is it's not because of tourism. Um, tourism didn't cause and doesn't generally cause the sexual exploitation of children. There are myriads of reasons um, why children are sexually exploited. Tourism is part of that, but certainly not all of that. And in fact, most of the sexual exploitation of children that happens around the world happens domestically within a family. But tourism does play an important part in protecting children because many offenders do use um, the tourist, tourist um, industry and their services to enable them to commit the crime. And this might be because they're going to a different place and no one knows them. They might be in, make contacts with, with local tourism staff who are very flexible, maybe ethically and morally. Who are able to find some ways to, to make some extra money by, by finding vulnerable children. So there is a, an overlap between the crime um, and the tourism industry and then and, and obviously children themselves and not just not just victims but all children because all children are potential victims and there's a real role in raising awareness with the children themselves about what's appropriate, what's not, what sort of situations they might find themselves in that might put them in potential danger and what they might be able to do about it. Um, sorry, if we go to the next slide. Uh, Daniela, you mentioned at the top about some of the, the impact of COVID-19. Um, obviously, there's been dramatic changes um, in the industry, particularly a huge decline in, in international tourism, as, as all your members will well know. Um, domestic tourism, interestingly, in some places is you know, obviously picking up, but has been for, for a few months now. And we hear examples from, from local partners of ours of, you know, certain parts of, of Indonesia and Philippines really picking up quite quickly uh, as people, you know, really want to get back into tourism. And with international borders and travel still quite difficult, the tour it, domestic tourism market is, is booming some places. Um, the increasing time that children are spent online and potentially being groomed and, and being 
perhaps groomed for later in-person contact and, and sexual abuse is a big challenge. Um, this is particularly with children who are left unattended online uh, because they've got the materials, they've got the, the technology to go online and sometimes they get down a, a rabbit hole um, and that can lead them into potentially dangerous situations. Um, there's ongoing risk of, of this decline in income. Obviously, a lot of people have lost their jobs or have been furloughed and that has an impact on their families. So we hear examples from our members um, of children being pulled out of school uh, to work because the other family members have lost their jobs in tourism and that maybe the children are selling souvenirs on the street and that can perhaps lead to, to other um, forms of, of exploitation. Um, with, we're expecting, and <clears throat> your members probably uh, are aware of this likely trend in the future as tourism recovers, perhaps an emphasis, emphasis on a different type of tourism maybe a bit less of the mass market, mass scale tourism, but more of the more experiential, small scale community tourism. And this is terrific. I think it's really great to be able to, to spread the benefits of tourism as far as possible, but there are vulnerabilities, especially to children as they, some of these types of tourism um, take off. Um, one of the things that we talk about at The Code is, is voluntourism where people often will pay to go to a, a particular setting to volunteer, sometimes to work with children, maybe to work in a school or a childcare centre. Um, and sometimes in orphanages, which is a real, a real concern for us. Um, and so we actually have a separate policy, in fact, on volunteerism, uh, giving extra guidelines for companies who do want to offer volunteerism products as to help direct them into what might be appropriate, what might not. And, if they are going to do any activities involving children to essentially have more stringent requirements on their customers to make sure that they're not, they're much less likely to, to be there to offend against children. Um, and so the code has been working still during this difficult time, um, but with a focus on recovery. And I know this has been talked about the last probably 18 months in the tourism industry that we need to look at a stronger and building back better type recovery. And we'd like to keep child protection um, at the forefront and, and the, you know, one of the highest priorities in that. Um, so if we have a look at the code itself um, and the full name of the code, if we pop on the next slide, is the Code of Conduct to Protect Children from Sexual Exploitation in Travel and Tourism. Um, so it's a bit of a mouthful, that's why we, we call it the code and the code.org uh, for short. Um, and if we pop onto the next slide, um, we'll see basically the, the mission statement, um, which is, a, as I mentioned, it's industry-driven um, initiative with a mission to provide awareness, tools, and support uh, to support the tourism industry <clears throat> in order to prevent the sexual exploitation of children. So that's all we do. We just do sexual exploitation in travel and tourism and the, the prevention thereof. Um, ECPAT does a, a much wider range of things and other NGOs do a lot of different things as well. But this is literally our only work is to to work with uh, tourism industry um, to help them um, figure out and, and take steps to to keep children uh, protected. Um, we don't expect tourism industry professionals to become child protection experts. That's not the expectation. That's not what we're aiming at. We're aiming at increased level of protection and decreased level of risk for individuals and businesses and children themselves um, in, involved in tourism. Um, if we have a look at the next slide, we'll have a look at the different cooperation with other organisations. So we work with the travel industry, the travel and tourism industry, obviously, and, and we'll see some of the companies we work with, and we'll talk a little bit in a couple of minutes about the sort of work that we do with them and support them with. We also engage with government, both national governments and, and local governments, to find ways to um, partner, uh, to support each other. Uh, and to essentially, if, if a government in a particular place is doing something well, we would like to highlight that and we would like to let our members know that that's happening. Um, and the other side of that, I guess, is if something isn't being done particularly well, we like to engage our members to maybe exert some of their pressure and their influence to, to lobby for, for improvements, maybe in the child protection uh, uh, phone number hotline, or the standards um, in, in that particular lo locale or, or country. Um, and then obviously we work with our local code representatives. This is the, the LCRs here. 
and with the ECPAT network and with other NGOs. Some of them are do um, victim support. So if we've identified um, a, a child that's been the victim, then there are local NGOs that can help um, with recovery and rehabilitation uh, and support to, to those child victims. Because you know, obviously for, for every crime, there is a victim and, and that's a really important part of, of, the, of the situation. Um, I mentioned before uh, about some of the national legislation that's, that's taking place. And so we're seeing some of this in Peru, um, in parts of Colombia and also in India. But we take that as a really good sign that there can be a very positive collaboration between governments and the tourism mm -hmm. industry direct, directly. Um, and in some cases, um, governments have introduced their own national code of conduct. And we think that's terrific. We don't see that as a competitor Absolutely. to us at all. Absolutely. I, in relationship with this topic, we have a, a question from, from our okay. audience. Uh, is there any model legislation, code, or recommendation that can be used uh, for our organization, like SCAL International, for example? We can, uh, where can we obtain these documents and can we publish and share them? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the very start of the question. Um, so, uh, if, if there are any model that we can use, like a members or organization for share and, and publish uh, in, in these kind of things. You mentioned, for example, exist uh, in different country, uh, code of conduct or legisl legislation about it. Uh, how can obtain this information for share with our member or internally? Okay. Internally, yeah, I, I can I can track down probably some of those examples from Latin America, um, where you know there there will be a, a national code setting out some of the, the criteria for for operating. Some of these are only on child protection, and some are a bit broader. Um, I don't have any you know literally with me, but I, I can certainly take that question and and um, you know update you with. with Maybe an example okay. or two. Of yeah, yeah, and, and we, we, we can work in the, in the future with, with you and, and the code to prepare material for share with our members. Sure. Yep. Yeah, yep. like an example and help to, to work on it. Yep, definitely. Okay, thank you. Um, so if we pass on to the next slide, um, we'll just have a look at, at the basic things that we do. So we, we help tourism companies improve their work on child protection. Um, throughout their operations. This isn't something that just the CSR department does or just the, the frontline staff do. It's some, something that we really encourage to be taken on <clears throat> by management, but then working through the entire organization to become, um, become part of that, uh, the culture of that organization. And in fact, we get feedback from um, employees from member companies that becoming a member of the code that actually really enhances their appreciation for their employer and for the company and they feel really proud to be associated with, with this as a proactive and responsible uh, tourism uh, practice uh, because there's been a lot of stigma in the past as, as you know and we talked a little bit about that it's just an issue that no one wants to talk about it's too hard um, and it's it's quite a, a fear um, that, that people have about talking about this because they, there's a reluctance to acknowledge that it's a problem. Um, we have about uh, 380 members now in, in over 50 countries. Some of these are the biggest hotel chains in the world. Some of them are individual guest houses or restaurants or uh, tour operators. So the, the membership varies dramatically. It's all different parts of the tourism industry. Um, outbound, inbound, business to business, um, it, it, mice, uh, and then you know airlines and airports, hotels. So it, it's a very mixed membership. And what we think is that the criteria, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, can apply mostly to to all of those different types of businesses. So it's it, it's quite a flexible criteria. Um, and since we all launched our first e-learning uh, back in 2013, over one million staff members from these uh, member companies have completed training either via the e-learning or we do sometimes with our local code representatives, we can um, provide in-person training to, to companies who are members of the code. Um, if we go to the next slide, I think I touched on this a moment ago. The idea is that membership of the code is not an indication that there's been any problem in the past with exploitation to do with that business. Rather, it's being proactive and, and responsible in increasing the level of, of child protection. So it's being, 
it's kind of mitigating risk in some ways. It's, it's protecting against risk of reputational damage, risk of potential legal action if, if an offender is found to be um, taking, you know, committing a crime to do with your business and you haven't taken preventative action, it can be a legal issue and a financial issue and a reputational issue. So it's a really proactive thing, um, we, we think, and we, we, try and, um, we try and market it as such. Um, if we pop to the next, I'll talk about quickly the, the six criteria, just so you get an idea of what membership of the code you know, actually uh, entails and what it looks like for members, member companies. Um, so on the next slide, we'll have a look just at the six criteria. It, so the, the first is, I think I touched on this, is to have a policy and to have relevant procedures in place for staff if they see a potential case of a child being exploited or in danger of, of exploitation. Um, that includes reporting mechanisms. It includes accountability of management to take action where appropriate. And it also includes, um, the policy should include a expression of zero tolerance in that uh, business both from employees and pertaining to customers of uh, sexual exploitation of children. So they're the kind of key factors to include in, in the policy and procedures. Sometimes these policies are included in things like the HR policy. Sometimes they're a standalone child protection policy, um, but it's, it's something that we think is really important as part of a, a business operation. The second criteria is, is training of employees. Uh, I mentioned the e-learning trainings and, and I'll have some examples in a couple of minutes of these. Um, but it's basically the examples I was giving before about looking at scenarios and what might be uh, a trigger point or might be dangerous, but also training employees a little bit about the issue itself because a lot of people have very different understandings of what a child is, of what sexual exploitation might mean, um, about what victims might look like, uh, about what perpetrators might look like and about their responsibilities as well. So we find that the training is, is quite well received. It's not a long process, the e-learning trainings. Um, some of the in-person trainings can be half a day or a one day uh, process, but the e-learning modules are more to give an introduction to the topic. Um, and the other thing is we've designed them to be role specific. So we have an e-learning module for, um, uh, for tour operators. We have an e-learning module for security staff for housekeeping, things like this. Um, the third criteria is to work with the supply chain. So essentially to include a clause in contracts um, with transportation partners or with accommodation partners, um, so that you're asking them not necessarily to become a member of the code, but also to make sure that they're doing their due diligence and taking action um, on child protection through their operations as well. And so that you as a business aren't, you know, um, secondhand, you know, sorry, indirectly uh, putting children at risk through your suppliers. The fourth criteria is to provide information to customers and to travellers. So sometimes this is a, a video the, such as the one that we saw earlier. Um, Air France showed one on some of their flights a while ago. Sometimes we see um, member companies put up um, posters with talking about the fact that uh, sexual exploitation is a crime. Um, Sometimes these posters are in hotel rooms. Sometimes they are a bit more subtle. Maybe they're behind a bathroom door. It's up to the up to the company, and we understand that they've got a business to run and a brand to manage. Um, so we don't want to um, get in the way of that, but we like to to encourage them to provide information in a proactive way to to customers where they can. The fifth criteria here is to work with stakeholders. So this is others in the industry, but it might also be the um, if we're talking again about the hotel example, it might be local um, restaurants and bars and nightclubs in the area. It might be the local taxi network, but it might also be the local child protection NGO and also the local police. So that there's some sort of relationship there um, in advance of a problem being seen. So that there's some familiarity to know, you know what the police response might be. For example, if you call them, are they going to refer you somewhere else or are they able to take action themselves? So working with stakeholders we find is really a, a crucial part as well. And then the last criteria is essentially just a brief online annual report um, back to the code, just so we can get a global picture of what the tourism industry is doing. Because we do hear a lot about what the UN is doing, what governments and NGOs like ECPAT and others are doing. But I think there's a real something missing here. We don't get a good sense of what the industry itself is contributing to child protection. And I think that's a real shame for the industry and, and for us because, you know, companies 
and our members of the code and, and others are doing lots of great things. And I think that should be that should be emphasized as well. So they're, yeah, so they're the, they're the six things and companies do these at different times. They do them in their own way. It changes over time. It's not a it's not a fact. It's not the case where if you become a member of the code within six months, you have to have done all these six things. It's, it's not like that. It's a very self paced, self directed um, steps of implementation. And then the secretariat's role and the role of our local code representatives is to support member companies through these steps as they as needed. So it might be giving a template or an example of a policy that, that works for a company. It's giving access to the, the online training. Um, it's giving sample materials for travelers, things like this. So that's the role and that's how it fits between the, the uh, business members of the code and then the local code representatives and, and us at the secretariat. Um, so if we go to the next slide, you'll have a look at some of the some of the types of um, of members, and you'll see Skull there, right in the middle. <laughs> Very happy to see. Although, yeah. Um, so as I said, we've got some of the biggest um, operators and multinationals in, in the world, um, all the way down to to very localized um, operators and uh, companies, uh, including even restaurants and um, and things like that. Uh, some of these companies become members at each of their country operations. Some of them become members just at the global headquarters and essentially implement the criteria of the code internally. Again, that's something that the company can decide for themselves. And it's something that can change over time, depending on the priorities of the company um, and of the, the, the situation that they're facing. Um, some of these companies are very public about their membership of the code and others prefer to be a little quieter. Uh, and again, that's up to them. We don't enforce uh, any type of, of recognition. What we do do though, is we put all of their names on our website and a little profile of, of what they've been doing, unless they request that it not be public, of course. Um, but we do find that almost every company, I think that's a member of the code is happy to be presented on our website as a member, one of this uh, leading group of industry um, participants that are taking positive steps on child protection. Um, I mentioned before that I'd speak a little bit about a couple of cases that we've seen of, of uh, protection of children in action. So the next slide shows a little bit of, um, of a couple of these cases. Um, both of these ones in, in airlines um, a couple of years ago. Um, so the first one um, was uh, the American Airlines case where I think that the story went, there was a check-in agent um, who reported a case of, of a suspicious passenger on a domestic flight. Um, so passports weren't required, but she flagged um, due, while the, the plane was in flight that she had suspicions about, uh, about a customer and a minor. And so when the plane landed at the other end, the law enforcement were waiting there and they separated them and interviewed and they found that, yes, this was in fact a, a teenager who was being trafficked by, by this older person. Um, and in the States, trafficking and sexual exploitation of children is, is almost synonymous. Um, so that, that was a, a pretty clear case. And it turns out that the, um, the staff member had, had received training. Uh, I think it was in-person training in that case. Um, there was a couple of headlines there about uh, hotels failing police checks. So this was out of the UK a couple of years ago, where police essentially um, sent in a 15 year old to try and check in with an older man um, without providing identification. Uh, and I think it was 10 out of 13 of the hotels that they checked, um, just let the child in without any questions, um, despite her displaying some of the signs that I talked about um, of coercion and, and maybe being dressed inappropriately. So it was just an indication that uh, frontline staff, it, it's not their fault, but sometimes they're not aware of what to look out for. And they're not aware that it, a lot of people think that this won't happen in the UK. It, it, it does. It happens all over the place, unfortunately. Um, and then the last one maybe I'll talk about is a different flight attendant. Um, and this, sorry, a different flight example. And this one was a, an attendant in flight um, who actually noticed a, a child looking under duress and looking distressed um, during the flight and, and took action. Uh, and in fact, I think in this case, she left a note, uh, left a piece of paper and a pen in the lavatory. So uh, when the child went, she was able to uh, explain her situation. Um, so it was quite quick thinking. And again, when the plane landed, um, the appropriate action was able to be taken by law enforcement. So there are cases every year that we hear of children being um, you know, 
being saved, if for want of a better word, from exploitation. But unfortunately, every year we, we do also hear cases of sexual exploitation still taking place, unfortunately. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, I have a, a interesting question um, from the, our audience. In your opinion, what is the impact of uh, private rental activities such as Airbnb, for example? Yeah, it's a very good question and it's a challenging one. Um, there's a few issues. One is that Airbnb doesn't see itself as a tourism operator. They see themselves mainly as a, a, a technology platform, essentially. And it's not, um, actually, I shouldn't name names, but <laughs> um, examples such as, as this. But the online world and the tourism world are becoming obviously increasingly interconnected and the boundaries are becoming more and more vague. Um, but for companies that do operate largely in the online sphere, we still think they have a role to play. And as much as some of them try and dissociate themselves legally from a situation where a crime might, might occur, I think that's getting challenged a bit more. And I think it, it should be challenged and can be challenged. Um, but it is, it, it is challenging um, the industry and it's challenging the issue of sexual exploitation of children because often it's a contactless engagement <clears throat> with the customer or with the, with the person who's been connected with the transport or the accommodation provider or whatever. And so there's a lot, you don't have a check-in staff, you don't have a housekeeping person go past every day. So there is a lot less, um, a lot fewer chances to see suspicious activity going on. But nonetheless, we think that they're, the, these sort of tech players do have a role to play and can still take steps through training of their staff, through getting feedback from, from maybe the properties that they're letting out. Um, I don't know if we'll get to the step of vetting clients, for example, but I think there are still some steps that can be taken um, to, to make sure that at least there's a slightly increased level of awareness and also awareness of customers and, and people who use these services that they're not immune, they're not, going, they're not invisible just because they, they don't have to talk to the host of their accommodation. The people will still be looking out for, for them if they're on the street, if they're moving, if they're taking transport there. And you probably saw on the previous slide that Uber in the USA has become a member. And that, yeah. I think that's a re really good example of, of a- Exactly, a and this is part of the change, you know what I mean? When the company yeah. are involved in, 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 about this issue. Yeah, absolutely. And we've heard cases in, in the US of, of Uber drivers basically seeing a suspicious situation with passengers and, and taking action, taking them to the police station, essentially. So, you know, it, it is good to see that there is some momentum coming from with that in that sector of the industry. We'd love to see more, of course, but we think we're taking some, we're making some steps forward. Okay. The, the last question that we have sure. here is, does the code or any other organization identify how spot of child sexual exploitation to generate economic pressures to stop it? <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it is a good question. As I said, it, it's, there are stereoty stereotypes of places um, around the world and, and where I'm based in Southeast Asia is, is obviously uh, historically one of those. I would say that that happens more through the ECPAT International Network and through the, the local ECPAT members because they're they're on the ground and they're talking about real hotspot um, towns and cities more specifically than countries or regions. And so we've seen a few good examples and maybe the one that comes to mind is, is Cartagena in Colombia, um, where they've had a campaign that's been ar arranged by the local industry as well as the local um, ECPAT member or our local code representative. Um, and it's it's called the, the wall. It's it's saying please put this wall up. We want to keep Cartagena a child-friendly and a family-friendly location. Um, and, and you won't, you won't pass this wall is the, is the expression I think is used. Um, so that's a way of sort of highlighting both the fact that that was a suspected and a probable hotspot in the past, but also that they're wanting to change that image and to, to make it a, a more attractive destination for families to make it less, less suspicious for other people who are traveling there um, and to really be pro proactive in, in making this um, part of the growth of the industry in a, in a re responsible and sustainable way. So that's probably the, the example that would come to mind for that. Great, please go ahead with your PPT. So um, I mentioned uh, briefly, and I'll just go through these next few slides quickly if that's okay. 
the, the online learning that we um, provide. And so this is available for all of our code member companies and it's available for as many staff as they would like. Um, there's no there's no limits for you know, for the number of people that participate in this. It's available, I think, now in 10 different languages. Um, and I think for nine or 10 different staff profiles. Um, and this one you see is for a tour operator and travel agent. Um, if we pop to the next slide, um, we have different things about things to look out for, what to report if you're if you're taking action and making a report to, to the local hotline. We do some basic background on what sexual exploitation of children is, what it might look like, what it is not. Um, and then we take the participants of the training through a few different scenarios. Um, so for example, we'll go to the next slide and we'll see one of the, the scenarios. Um, and we sort of give a, a scenario there on the left, a description of what's happened. And then we ask the participant of the training, what would you do in this, in this case? What would be, you know, what would be your response? Um, and so there is some good answers. There are some better answers there and often there's some really not good answers. And then the person is, is given feedback on that answer and can, um, yeah, can answer the question again or be advised actually about maybe you should have thought of this or t taken this approach differently. Um, and then at the end of the, the, um, the module, the e-learning module, if we go to the next slide, um, we do have a, a brief quiz essentially to, to check that there has been some knowledge gained or that the, there is some awareness. Um, so the, the participant does 10 questions, multiple choice questions, um, and if they receive 80% correct, um, they receive electronically um, a certificate and that's shown on the next slide. Um, so the certificate is yeah, essentially it's sent directly to them, um, but we also keep that uh, record or that, um, that piece of data, let's say, of the completion of the e-learning. We keep that on our member portal and our, the member profile. So that's basically our, our internal database that uh, we uh, members can use to track their implementation of those six criteria, which I talked about. That that the figures aren't made public, but the um, whether a company has done those six criteria is part of their public profile. But for the companies themselves only, they have access to all of the, their employees who have done the e-learnings, when they did them, which module they did, I think now which language they did it in. So that's really useful, I think, for companies to, to keep track, especially big companies, to keep a track of, of which staff are doing it, which ones maybe need to do a refresher. Um, and then uh, obviously they can you know, take action and based on, based on the results there. Um, so I think that's it. I think the next slide is the last one that you might have for me, um, which is yeah. actually saying thank you. So, um, I, the, the questions have been really great. So I'm looking forward to, to perhaps um, fielding a couple more. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, I want to say thank you, you Dam Damian, for, for your participation. We will say uh, goodbye to you all with a finite video. I think that is uh, fantastic. Um, and I promise uh, to all of our members that we will share with uh, all of you all the information that you provide them in from your side. So I think that it will be fantastic. So uh, as soon as possible, we will do this. Um, also, thank you uh, to our audience and we look forward to see you in our next webinar. Thank you. And we share please now the, the video. Thank you, Damien. Thanks.
Thank you very much again. Have a good day, good evening, or good afternoon, the vendor you are. Thank you, Damien. And we stay in contact. Cheers. Thank you.